and I worked for the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. I thought I'd start with a story. Uh, I uh, grew up in a military family. My dad was in the Air Force, and we moved all over the world. And then I tried to join the Air Force in 1971, but I actually flunked my induction physical because of an old high school football injury. So I had to get a waiver to get into the military when most people were trying to get out during the Vietnam War. And after my training, I was sent to Travis Air Force Base in California. That was an airlift base for the war in Vietnam. And as it turned out, my first roommate in the barracks was one of the leading organizers in the GI resistance movement. And I've always felt that I was like given this gift from the heavens to be put in this room because at night they would have meetings and I'm sitting in the corner thinking, oh my God, these are all commies. And you know, I grew up behind the barbed wire fences on the military basis. I was a right winger. I was a young Republican for Nixon in 68 as a 16-year-old as a organizing for the Nixon campaign in Northwest Florida. So conservative there, they call it Lower Alabama. And so that's, that was my orientation. So being in this room where these people would have meetings a couple nights a week, white guys talking about the war, black guys talking about racism in America, they were Black Panthers, it changed my life completely. And after, it took me about six months and my whole life was, you know, completely changed. And I got out of the military and I was going to college in Florida, at the University of Florida, just ready to graduate. And I got recruited by the United Farm Workers Union to become an organizer of fruit pickers in Florida. And so I never finished college. And I've been an organizer ever since. And so it, now fast forward to 1982. I'm living in Orlando, Florida, the pit of hell. And I'm watching C-SPAN. And they're covering this huge demonstration in New York City, almost a million people protesting against nuclear weapons. And when it was over, they cut away to a right-wing conference, and the speaker was Lieutenant General Daniel Graham, Ronald Reagan's head of SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars. And in the Q&A after General Graham's speech, somebody says, General Graham, aren't you worried? They say there's almost a million people protesting in New York today against nuclear weapons. He said, no, I think it's fantastic. They're out there protesting against nuclear weapons and we're moving into space and they don't have a clue. Let them keep doing what they're doing. And so it was in that moment that I said, holy shit, you know, I, I, I gotta start looking at this. Here I live in Orlando, part of the Space Coast as it's called. And so the next year, 83, I went to work for the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice where I worked for 15 years and we began taking people to the space center over and over and over again, protesting military satellite launches, protesting uh, rocket launches, uh, and protesting against uh, nuclear power launches because the nuclear industry views space as a new market and wants to use nuclear power in space to mine, to mine the planets and the asteroids for these precious minerals. You know, they say the Earth is the Mars Society actually says that the Earth is a rotting, stinking, dying planet and that we need to move our civilization to Mars. They want us to terraform Mars. Do you know what terraform means? Turn it into a green, livable planet. Can you imagine the cost of terraforming Mars? The president of Lockheed, uh, excuse me, the president of the Mars Society is an executive at Lockheed Martin who would build the rockets for these missions. In fact, you've heard of the Halliburton Corporation, right? They're building a drilling mechanism to mine Mars. And these little rovers that are driving around Mars today are doing soil identification and sampling. 
because they believe that magnesium and cobalt and uranium are on Mars, helium-3 and water on the moon, gold on the asteroids. And so they say, don't worry that we're running out of resources on the planet Earth because we can go and mine the sky in the future. And so one of the jobs of the Space Command today, part of full spectrum dominance, is to build a parallel military highway between the Earth and the planetary bodies so that when the day comes that you can actually go out and mine the sky, that you have the technology to do it, they want to control the pathway on and off the planet Earth. In fact, in a congressional study called Military, Sports, uh, Military Space Forces the Next 50 Years, commissioned by the Congress, this study was, in the 80s, they say in there that we would be able to hijack rival shipments upon return if they were not authorized to leave the planet and go out and to mine the sky. So this is the level of planning and, and uh, space technology development now underway today by NASA, which is controlled, always been controlled by the Pentagon. I think it's important to also remember the story about the Nazi scientists that were brought to the United States at the end of World War II. Werner von Braun, Major General Walter Dornberger. Dornberger was in charge of the Hitler V1 and V2 rocket program that Hitler used to terrorize London and Paris and Brussels at the end of the war. Dornberger came to New York and became vice president of Bell Aeros Aerosystems in New York. And he testified before the Congress in the 1950s and said, gentlemen, I didn't come to this country to lose the Third World War. I lost two already. And he talked about the importance of orbiting battle stations that would allow the United States to control the Earth below, but also, again, to control the pathway on and off the planet. So these are the technologies. And these Nazis were the scientists that helped bring those technologies to the US. They basically created the U.S. space program after the war was over. They also, because there were about a thousand of these Nazis brought over, they were also brought into the CIA to help create the CIA because they had all the figures. They knew who all the communists were throughout Europe. And they were brought into this create the CIA. They were brought in to create the flight medicine program at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. They were the Nazi scientists that were doing mind control experiments in uh, Germany on the Jews and other prisoners of war. They were brought over to create the LSD and MK Ultra mind control experiments in the 60s. You remember when people were jumping out of windows from bad LSD trips and all that? Those were the Nazi scientists. And so I've always asked the question, was there an ideological contamination that came along with these Nazi scientists. Deutschland über alles, master of space. The slogan, the logo that they wear on their uniform at the Space Command headquarters in Colorado Springs. One of my friends, uh, Ardeth Platty, uh, a nun, I've heard her say a few times, we can kill them fast, or we can kill them slow. America has become a killing culture. And now our culture is being militarized. About two years ago, a friend of mine that works at Bath Ironworks in Maine, where I live, he's worked there 35 years building Aegis destroyers. He and I learned that Sears had a new clothing line for kids, for boys. And so we went to the next town to the Sears store, and we went in there into the little boys section, and there they were, a whole line of military uniforms for little boys. Now, it's not rich kids that buy clothes at Sears. They're working class people, poor people. And so the message that is being planted in the minds of working class and poor people especially children in this country, is this is all you're going to be. This is your future in America. Colleges and universities across the country, 
mathematics department, computer, computer engineering department, physics department, astronomy departments, as their budgets are being cut because of state uh, funding crisis, those departments are turning to the Pentagon for funding. But when you sign a pact with the devil, you become the devil. And so we see now the militarization of academia across the country. A friend of mine, Bob Anderson, in Albuquerque tells a story about on, at the State Public University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, they now have a walled off secret part of the campus where all the weapons corporations working with Kirtland Air Force Base are doing high tech space weapons uh, research and development and you're not allowed to go uh, onto this place on the campus, on this public university campus. So we see this militarization of our culture here in America today. And that's why so many communities are on their knees. Politicians, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. They're on their knees begging for drone uh, bases, drone testing sites, missile defense deployment sites, you name it. Anything to keep the dollars flowing because that's the job policy of America today is weaponization and militarization. That's what we are. We become a killing culture. Earlier I mentioned that that the Pentagon's been using the words for some time now, security export. You know, that our role under corporate globalization not will not be to make things anymore. We're not going to make shoes, cars, refrigerators, clothing. We're going to make weapons. And so it's no coincidence that today that the number one industrial export product of America is what? Weapons. And when weapons are your number one industrial export, what's your global marketing strategy for that product line? There we are. Obama has announced, the good Democrat, has announced that we're going to pivot into the Asia Pacific now that 60% of the U.S. Navy will now be redeployed into the Asia Pacific. For what? North Korea? North Korea? Are you kidding? When North Korea did one of their satellite launches about three years ago, I remember reading in the aerospace industry press these, these U.S. Air Force people mocking them, laughing at them, saying they don't have enough satellite technology to even track their own space uh, launch. They said we were tracking it the whole way, but they couldn't even track it. They're not the enemy. They're not who we're going after in the region. Although we, we heighten, you know, we create the fear about North Korea in order to get the American people all jacked up so they'll go along with this pivot. But in fact, it is not aimed at them. It is, in fact, aimed at China. And so I think the determination has been made that while we can't compete with China economically in the future, if we control their access to resources, we hold the keys to their economic engine. And China imports 80% of their oil on ships. And so if the US could theoretically embargo or blockade their importation of resources, then we hold the gun to their head, right? We call the shots. And so I believe that's the strategy underway today. Very dangerous, very provocative, very expensive for the American people, but that's the strategy. And NATO is being brought into this. NATO that has been expanding after the fall of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, Mikhail Gorbachev was worried about NATO expansion. He was promised NATO will not expand one centimeter into the former Eastern Bloc. When Bill Clinton became president, he began violating that promise. And today we see NATO on steroids. Moving into Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, right on Russia's border. Now talking about moving into Georgia on Russia's border. Missile defense deployments in Romania. Missile defense radars in Turkey. Missile defense deployments in Poland. 
and then U.S. and NATO warships moving into the Balt Baltic Sea and other regions. Now that the Arctic ice is melting, moving up there as well, competing with Russia for control of the oil under the Arctic Ocean. And so NATO and its allies being brought into this encirclement of both Russia, who has the world's largest supply of natural gas, and China. The U.S. has been recently deploying missile defense systems in Japan, Okinawa, South Korea, Taiwan, and on Aegis, Navy Aegis destroyers that are built where I live in Bath, Maine, beginning this coastal encirclement of China. As a result of this Obama pivot, they say, you know, we're going to need more bases, more ports of call. And so there's pressure now on Guam, the Philippines, Vietnam, other places to open up the bases that we were using before or to increase the size of existing bases. And then that's where Jeju Island comes in. Many of you, I hope, have heard about little Jeju Island just off the Korean Peninsula. And on the south side of Jeju Island is a little village called Gangjon Village. I know Anne has been there. We've been, we tried to get several members from Veterans for Peace there one time. Elliot and Tarek Koff and Mike Hasty from Oregon. They got off the airplane. They were met by security who had their picture and they sent them home. Since then, we've been able to get other members of Veterans for Peace to go there. We were a little more discreet about it. Uh, this island on the south side, this village, Gangjon Village, is 500-year-old village where they worship nature. And just offshore are these UNESCO-recognized soft coral reefs that are the most unbelievable. The videos, the pictures of these things, they're alive and moving. Unbelievable. And today they're out there dredging in order to make it possible for the U.S. to bring aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines and these Aegis destroyers into this Navy base that is being built there in the village. And so these endangered soft coral reefs will be destroyed as a result of this base. And the sacred rocky coast, Gurumbi they call it, where they've worshipped nature and the passing of their relatives in all these years, has been blasted by the Samsung Corporation that is the, the lead contractor. They have a construction division, Samsung. They and a couple of other corporations control South Korean government. And so they're going to cover this rocky coast with cement to build the docks. Now the United States, when you talk to politicians about it, they say, what are you talking about? We don't know anything about Jeju Island. We don't have anything to do with it. But a few years ago, I was trying to get Americans to call the South Korean embassy in Washington to say, don't build this base. And I was told, and I heard from several of my friends, they emailed me, they were told the same thing. Don't call us, call your government. They're twisting our arm, making us build this base. This is one of our cost-sharing deals. We get the allies to share costs. They build the bases, they pay for base expansion. This is how you know, we cut costs of the empire now as the citizens at home begin to effectively demand you know, some cuts in the military spending. So the people on Jeju, beleaguered as they are, have an incredible spirit. After six years now, daily, daily, and nightly now, it's turning into 24 hours a day protest against the construction of this Navy base. They still gather and they still sing to each other and they dance to each other nightly as a way to maintain their spirit, like the Civil Rights Movement. Resilient, love, determination, because they know something about fascism. At the end of World War II, when the United States beat the Japanese that were occupying Korea, Japanese driven out of Korea. Who did the U.S. put in charge of Korea? 
at the end of World War II. The former collaborators, the Koreans who collaborated with the Japanese fascists, were put in charge of Korea by the United States. The very worst Koreans you can imagine, right? The traitors we betrayed the people. We put them in charge. And so the people revolted. This, is, this was the seeds of the Korean War. And on Jeju Island, they revolted as well. And the US military directed a crackdown on the people there. And up to 80,000 people on Jeju Island were killed. They called it the April 3rd massacre. April 3rd, 1948 began this massacre that led to the deaths of more than 80,000 people on the island, just the island alone. And so today, they see this Navy base being built, and they feel that boot of the American fascism one more time on their neck. And it's ironic because as a way to kind of apologize to the people of Jeju some years ago, the South Korean government named Jeju the Peace Island, the island of peace. And now on the island of peace comes this US Navy base. And there's talk of an Air Force base to come with it and more. So I've been telling people that Jeju is the perfect symbol for all of us of this reality of Obama's pivot into the Asia Pacific. The environmental implications, the human rights implications, the peace implications, all coming together in this struggle on Jeju Island. So on the table out here, I urge you to pick up this newsletter and learn more about it. Every, every year for the past several years, I've been reading about it in magazine Aviation Week and Space Technology. The Space Command gathers, and they do a computer war game of an attack on China set in the year 2016. And I talked earlier about the X-37, the military space plane that stayed up in orbit for more than 400 days, a super drone. And in this computer war game set in the year 2016, it flies down from orbit and drops an attack on China. China today has 20 nuclear missiles that are capable of hitting, reaching the west coast of the United States. And so in this first strike, the US tries to take out those 20 nuclear missiles. And the first weapon used is the X-37, and then other, other technologies are used as well in a follow-on in, in that first strike. But China inevitably is able to fire a couple of their nuclear missiles in a retaliatory strike. And that's when the so-called missile defense system is used. The shield, after the first strike soared, plunges into the heart of Russia or China. They then fire their retaliatory capability. And that's when these so-called missile defense systems, defense is the wrong word, isn't it? because it's a key element in first strike attack planning. But that's why Russia and China today are just freaking out over these missile def defense deployments that are surrounding both of their countries on land, on sea. And Russia is saying, wait a minute, you keep doing this, NATO keeps expanding, you bring these missile defense systems surrounding us, we're gonna pull out of that new START treaty that we signed with Obama. Modest as it was, modest reductions of nuclear weapons. But we're going to have to pull out of it because we can't afford to get rid of any of our nuclear weapons because we've got to have a retaliation against your missile defense system. China's saying, wait a minute, we might only have 20 nuclear missiles, but heck, we're going to have to buy some submarines now and make some submarines and take some of those missiles and put them under the ocean so they're survivable. And so we we're off to a new arms race. As we're being told that missile defense is good for us and it's gonna protect us. And remember what I said earlier, Ford Drum up here in upstate New York is on the list, competing with Maine to be the East Coast deployment site for missile defense. So keep your eye on that ball. One more issue for you to work on up here. Just what you needed, right?
it's, it's a lot of bad news, I will say. But the good part of it is, for me, is in the work that I do with the Global Network, we were created in 1992. And early on, what we discovered was, as we learned about space, is that in order to tie this whole space warfare program together, the US had to set up bases all over the world. Downlink stations, big, imagine these big radoms, these big white golf ball looking things, receiving stations, talking to the satellites as the satellites orbit the Earth. They're over this particular country at this particular time, so they're beaming signals down. And it's big relay process. And so in these communities, in these countries, in England, in Australia, in Norway, in Greenland, uh, and many other places around, there are groups organizing people like you saying, we don't want our country to be part of this US Star Wars first strike warfare system. And so these are the organizations that became the core of the global network that we ha have as members today. So all over the planet, people are organizing, building. The reason why we got into this Jeju issue is one of our South Korean board members went there and said, hey, my god, the global network, they, you know, we got to get onto this issue because they're going to have missile defense systems there on these US warships. That's how we got uh, involved in that issue. So for me, I learned that we've got to globalize our resistance as they globalize corporate as corporate global you know corporations go global capitalism works together globally nato has become the global resource extraction service for corporate globalization we too have to globalize our resistance and as we do that and we get to know the people around the world who are organizing against this in every place imaginable we begin to see that oh my god we're not alone and we don't have to do this all by ourselves people in new york don't have to stop this thing by yourself people in the united states don't have to stop this thing by ourselves but we work together all over the world we really can have and do have a great power greater power than we realize let me stop there. Thank you very much for listening. We'll open it up. Go ahead. Stand and yell, please. Well, let me just give a couple examples. One of our board members lives in Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. She was a more traditional, we'd say Democrat. She was a part, member of the New Democratic Party, progressive party there. And she recently, uh, just a couple of years ago, ran for, for the parliament as an NDP member. So really traditional political work in addition to her piecework. But she's left her party and is now protesting directly outside the offices of NDP members in Halifax. Because the NDP has recently come out in favor of the biggest appropriation of funds in the history of Canada for the military to build warships. Now, what does Canada need warships for? Who are its enemy that they have to spend massive money on warships? Taking that money out of social programs. Well, as it turns out, because again of the melting of the ice in the Arctic region, and Canada is, has a huge border in the Arctic, <clears throat> the United States is trying to get the N Nordic nations, uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Canada, to come into a NATO, uh, Navy program to be able to uh, fight against Russia to claim ownership of the Arctic regions so that our corporations can take the oil. And so one way that we globalize is to make these connections 
uh, knowledgeable in our work. So as we talk about these issues, we take this information from our Canadian friends and we weave it into our articulation so that we expand the consciousness of the, of the public so people begin to see the bigger picture. I like to think of it as a puzzle on the wall and we're adding pieces to the puzzle so the people get a better visual picture of what the, is really going on because people are, often say, you know, I'm just so damn confused. What, what, what's really happening here, you know? So I think that's part of it. And finding ways to support them. She goes out every week in front of the shipyard in Halifax, sometimes alone, sometimes with two or three other people. All right, how can I support her? What can I really do? I live, you know. Well, I can do a blog about it and put her picture on there and write about her. Put it on my Facebook, you know what I mean? Little things like that. But she gets excited about that and she writes about it in her blog. And so she connects her people then, you know. So these kind of small steps, solidarity, if you will, solidarity steps begin over time to pay off. So we recently were invited to send someone to Turkey. I earlier mentioned this conference in Turkey today. I couldn't come because it's this weekend. And so I, I sent a, a note to our board who's available to go. Well, one of our members, our chairperson from England, and one of our board members from Sweden, they said, we can go. So they're there now. And their job, well, because of this deployment of missile defense system by US and NATO into Turkey, aimed at Syria, part of, the, part of what I think is going to be a, a NATO war against Syria to take that government down, their mission is to go there and let the Turkish peace movement know that people all over the world are with them, are following this issue, we're in solidarity with them, and we're going to spread their message. And we want to work together with them. So I think these are just small ways that we begin to expand our peace movement into a global peace movement. Don't see ourselves so provincially as we often tend to do. Well, I'm not trying to demoralize anybody, uh, but uh, but I do think I do th think we can't sugarcoat this stuff. I believe this is my opinion is that we're living in fascism. We are living um, in a fascist state, and if that is demoralizing to hear that, I can't be responsible for other people's reaction. That's I don't have control over that, but I do think that the classic definition, Mussolini's definition of fascism, is when you wed corporations and government. And I think that's what we have clearly. I think that the corporations that control our government and literally most of the governments around the world uh, are out after one thing now. It's control of declining resources around the planet and they're militarizing every country. All my friends in Japan, England, Germany, you, I don't care where they are, they all tell the same story. We're militarizing, we're cutting social programs, that's a fact. Now, it is true that there is an epidemic of despair and disempowerment and depression amongst the people in America. Helen Caldicott says that, I forgot the exact percentage, but a high percentage of Americans are on antidepressants. That's a reality, one that I'm not responsible for. Believe me, they all got there long before they heard me speak. <laughs> but it is true that we do have an epidemic even within our peace movement of despair and a sense of uh, dispowerment and, and depression, literal depression. I feel it at times too. We all do. 
But I also believe, having read many, many stories over the years about the uh, about Hitler's uh, genocide of, of of the Jewish people in Europe, that w that uh, we can't ignore it. We can't wait until it's too late to respond. And part of it, the first step, I think, is admitting the problem, identifying the problem. And then from there, moving into resistance. And not feeling, and part of our, part of our despair and our depression is this feeling of isolation, which I hope I have ad addressed effectively. The antidote to that is that we work in community all over the world. And we find remarkable, resilient communities like Jeju. And we come into solidarity with them. Not only does it help them, but it helps us. Because they are a tremendous, tremendous role model. The Korean, I've been to Korea about four times. And I don't want to exaggerate too much. But to me, they're the best act, peace activists I've ever seen on the planet anywhere. They know fascism. They know how to organize and react to fascism because they've been living under it for a long, long time. And in the middle of that, they find joy. A little loud. Stand up and loud, please. That's a great question. You know, I, I, how many groups do we know that used to put out a newsletter and don't do it anymore because they just send emails? And so what happens if tomorrow the internet got shut down? Do most groups even have a mailing list anymore? Do they keep addresses the old way? I mean, think about that. I would venture to guess there's a lot that don't. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of practical reasons here. That's why we still publish a physical print newsletter, because not, and not everybody reads emails. I can't tell you how many people I know that tell me, oh, God, I have a thousand emails in my box. You know, I, no, I didn't see that email you sent me. Was, okay, do I hear that, you know, as an organizer? C can I send them something in the mail? There's a better chance they'll, they'll see it. So yes, indeed, we need to be really on the ball. And we need to all remember that, you know, how many times do we say that, oh, well, we're a little disappointed because not many people came to the meeting tonight. Well, what did we do to organize? Well, we sent an email out. But do we call the way we used to do in the old days? We had phone calling committee that would call all the members and say, come on out. Did we send anything in the mail? You know, so our organizing has become diminished because of the internet. Now, on one hand, it helps us, yes, truly. But on the other hand, it makes us a little lazy. Uh, go ahead. About South Korea, uh, having fascism imposed on them, the same dates correlate with what happened in Puerto Rico, with the U.S. Navy taking over their island and using their land as a bombing zone and the waters around it, another island. Uh, another place where the U.S. Navy the United States, I should say, has used as a jump-off point, the point of power for every U.S. invasion 
And I'll say that I know that the people of Vieques were one of the very first t t to uh, communicate with Jeju, yes. They've been there all along the way. I would also say that I think you'd be a fantastic person to go to Jeju. We're now looking for people to go for three or four weeks at a time. And because once you get there, you don't really want to leave. I know Anne uh, knows what I'm talking about. And so uh, if you're interested, let me know. There are, some, there are a few sources that can help us uh, raise some money for people that want to go, that are really serious, that want to be a part of that. But the idea is that you go there and then you come back and help teach people about not only Jeju, but about the whole pivot and what's really going on in the whole region. Yes, ma'am. If someone works for Lockheed Martin and his personality has changed, can he be mind, his mind can be controlled? He worked on this space shuttle. He worked on him in the Mars space shuttle. You know, and a lot of people in their company don't like working there. It's my son-in-law. They said, Jason, you open up a company and we'll go work for you. They don't like it either. His whole, everything, things have changed. He's a different kind of person now. So could, is it just because he doesn't like it, or do they do any mind control there, do you think? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. But I will say this. Uh, my friend that works at Bath Ironworks, been there 35 years, we do a radio show together every, every week. He won't talk on the radio anymore because he's suffering from... Uh, when they cut steel, the dust that comes from the steel is causing a brain problem. When he goes to the doctor, it's a company doctor, as you can imagine, these HMOs, you know, affiliated with the General Dynamics Corporation that owns Bath Iron Works. And he says, I think I have uh, poisoning from the toxins from this dust, and they said, what are you trying to hurt the company? The doctor says this. A few nights ago, a few nights ago, he, on a Sunday night, now tell me, have you ever heard this before? Sunday night, getting a call from the doctor's office saying the doctor was letting you go as a patient. Can you imagine? And so a few, uh, two years ago, he asked me to help him prepare a, uh, a petition saying, we want to build wind turbines at Bath Ironworks. And he got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workers to sign it. Now this indicates that clearly there are many, many, many people that feel like they're hostages of the military industrial complex. And I'm sure this is the same anywhere you go in the country. It's, a different, it's another form of slavery, isn't it? We had this institution of slavery for a couple hundred years, and now we're it was an economic system, wasn't it? Slavery was. And now we have this economic system of militarism that is all pervasive. It seems all powerful. It seems all controlling. Our communities are addicted to military production and military spending. It's as dark and as evil as slavery ever was. But we, even within the, the midst of it, there are these little sprigs of life, these little sprigs of of grass popping up through the cement, the workers who want out, who want another way. And so one other strategy we have to have is to find these people, whether they're on bases or inside of military production plants, and to show solidarity with them. My friend Peter, I said to him after he got these many petition signatures, he wasn't sure, he might get fired over this but he was willing to do it. I said to him, what do you want to do now? What do you think about going to the newspaper with this? He said, they'll really fire me then, but okay, I will. So I scheduled a meeting with our local paper, with the editorial, the editor, edi editorial page editor. He went in there, gave them the petitions. They wrote an editorial calling for the, what did they say, uh, diversification of Bath Ironworks, saying, we never thought the Navy base in Brunswick would close down. We never dreamed that would happen. What if the economy does go in the shitter? Maybe it's not a bad idea to start doing this. And so Peter Woodruff now goes 
well, up to the last two years, been on the radio, because we've been on the radio for about five years now. But he would go on the radio. He's the first BIW worker ever to come to a protest at one of the christenings of one of these Aegis destroyers in Bath to speak out. But he's never been fired. Why is that? Because it's like there's protection from him now because of that newspaper editorial, because of his public exposure. And so I, whenever I get a chance to speak to a military production worker, I say, you know, we're working hard. We in the peace movement, we're trying to convert the military industrial complex. We're working hard at it. We're talking about it. We're writing about it. But we can't do it alone. We need you guys inside. We need your unions to start talking about it. Back in the 80s, remember the really old days, the 80s? The economic conversion movement in America? One of the leaders of the, that was a time of the falling apart of the Soviet Union. We were gonna have this peace dividend. One of the leaders of the economic conversion movement in America was William Wimpersinger, the president of the International Association of Machinists. But now today, the president of the International Association of Machinists is putting out videos called Bombs Bursting in Air, talking about the joys of missile defense. So that's how far we've fallen. The unions have become frozen. So we've got to begin to get the workers inside to begin to demand that their unions come around and work so that they have an alternative, so they can be free of this slavery. Emphasis on space, the fact that the space shuttle was a lot program was allowed to fold without without any manned space replacement. They, they just, at this point, you don't need person things in space. Or how does that fit into the plan? I don't know if you heard the question. It's about the space shuttle and the manned manned missions on the space shuttle. Why did they let the manned stuff go? Why'd they let it come apart? I believe num number one is expense. It's very expensive. Number two, the, using uh, people in space originally was to dr romanticize it. Uh, and they've, they've got it now institutionalized in the budget. And so they don't need that quite as much for public relations purposes. Although there's still a lot of debate and within the industry that we need to get back to that. But because of robotics now, they, they really don't need the guys flying around on the space shuttle. The, when they retired the space shuttle, you might remember this story. They took one of them to Los Angeles. You remember that? Driving through the streets of Los Angeles to take it to a museum. And do you know they cut down 400 trees in order to clear the streets because it's so wide, so big. 400 trees were destroyed in order to get the space shuttle. I call it the gods of metal, right? It's the perfect uh, example of how we were taught to worship these, these weapons of war, these systems. Well, the military space plane, the X-37 that I was talking about, they call that the successor to the shuttle. And so, uh, really, it's all now about militarization. They were doing a lot of Star Wars tests on the space shuttle, but mostly it was sold to us as a civilian technology. Uh, in, the, in the scenario where it flies down and drops an attack on China, it would be a bunker buster type weapon that would be used in, in that kind of a situation because they would be going after the underground silos. Yeah. You talk about drones and you were saying that um we're creating more terrorists than we're killing. Uh, and this is not an accident. It's intentional. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that, the, the intentionality of creating more terrorists. As long as there's terrorists out there in Afghanistan and Pakistan, then we can't leave, can we? As long as there are terrorists in Africa, in Mali and Libya, Libya that has the largest supply of oil on the African continent. We can't leave, can we? And so by killing people for no, really no reason, no strategic reason, uh, but creating more enemies out of that as their families uh, become angry with the United States, 
They then move into operational activity against against the U.S. doing, uh, you know, fighting against us. Then we have an excuse to the American people that look, we can't leave. In fact, they even want to come to Boston now, right? They're in Boston. And now we have to lock down the entire city of Boston to protect you. So I believe that it's an intentional process, that they know they're killing civilians. They do it on purpose because they know that it will allow us to stay in the region longer. Because it's all about resource extraction. It's all about corporate profits for the military industrial complex. Yes, ma'am. Well, no, I wasn't surprised. But let me share a story, though. Remember the Persian Gulf War in the early 90s? Saddam Hussein? Well, with our space satellites, before that war began, they were able to pre-identify all of Saddam Hussein's military targets, OK? And in the first two to three days of the war, of the Persian Gulf War, the US military bombed 95% of those military targets. So the war was over after the first three days. But you might remember, it lasted for a couple months, right, Kathy? Two months or so? Where they played cat and mouse then with the remaining essentially 5% of technology. And during that time, they used 100 cruise missiles, costing a million dollars a piece. In Titusville, Florida, at the at that time, McDonnell Douglas, they were working three shifts a day, replacing those 100 cruise missiles. They used many other kinds of weapon systems as well. And in places all over the country, they were working three shifts to replace them. So it was profitable to extend it. But it was also ultimately, I read later in Aviation Week and Space Technology and Space News Magazine, a field test for the space technology infrastructure. They had never had a chance up to the early 90s to field test the entire apparatus that they had been building since Vietnam. The, the, the entire space control apparatus had never been field tested. So they used the opportunity of the Persian Gulf War to field test the whole system. I would submit to you that what we saw in Boston was a field test of the entire homeland security operation, OK? I don't know anything about these two guys, whether they're guilty or innocent. I don't have any more information than any of you. So whether it was just on the shelf waiting for the right moment, or it was part of a, of a uh, what's, what's the word for it? Uh, false flag operation. You, you decide. But they field tested the use of total surveillance, what they have available now today during that time. They field tested uh, the integration of local, state, and federal police agencies, homeland security, all that stuff together under essentially one command. They field tested closing down an entire American city and suburbs, right? They field tested, how do you do it? How does it work? How, and also, importantly, how does the media play a role in this entire operation? So that was, to me, just like uh, Iraq was in the early 90s, a field test of the existing technology system, how you pull it off. So that's my response. Uh, Yugoslav War, Kosovo War, it's also called and the bombing of the Chinese embassy by NATO, the US and NATO. Oops, that was an accident. The, the Kosovo War depleted uranium was used at that time, as it was in, in the Iraq War. And we now know a lot about Fallujah and the Gulf War, yes, absolutely. 
Well, again, I would, I would say, I would say if you, you know, kind of look at the timeline, it's every few years. I like to, I, I liken it to a, an alcoholic at the bar, you know what I mean? You need another drink, you know? Every few years, we need another one of these wars. And they serve multiple purposes. Number one, again, they field test the technology that's been developed since the last war. We know that with this computer, what do you call it, computer revolution, the technology changes almost on a daily basis. And so they like to have a field test every few years. So you go from the Persian Gulf War, you go to Kosovo, you go to, to the Iraq War, and now we're in, Af you know, in Africa. I mean, the stuff continually gets field tested along the way. It's a tremendous opportunity for ramping up production. It's a tremendous opportunity to uh, refocus the American people on quote unquote an enemy and to remind them that sacrifices, oh that word just sounds so uh, primitive to me. You know, every time I hear it I cringe, you know. It sounds, you know, like we're throwing somebody off the cliff, you know, in some, you know, uh, sacrifice of, uh, to the gods, you know. But, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's a sick, sick thing. But, they, you know, it, but it's, it's all part of how the minds of the American people are manipulated. Usage of drone warfare without involving a human being at the controls, the idea of having computer programming so that the human element would kind of go out of it completely. I don't know. I don't know very much about it, other than that I've heard that, that that's one of the kind of things that that they want to create autonomous, uh, robotic uh, abilities uh, to do many different things, not only fly airplanes, but things under the ocean and things on the ground. So yes, indeed, that is something they're working on. I don't really know much beyond that. That would function according to computer protocols, so that if you detect ABC, that already the drone has been pre-authorized to JFK, et cetera. So that the notion of a human intervention at the last minute, if the circumstances change, that might be created, empty, and vertical. Swarming drone concept. Actually, they've been working on it since 2007. And they have a new article out in their JPL, uh, APL magazine on this whole subject. And one of the pictures they have in there are several small drones that are communicating with themselves over a specific network uh, as they are following vehicles, following them, and then they will be told at a certain point when the vehicle does a certain thing in this computer program, they are, the, the drones know that's when they're to take out the vehicle. Oh, nothing like a computer program. It's so free, right? And this is where this is where a lot of the nanotechnology comes in. N nanotechnology is making things so 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 small that they would also have the ability to replicate themselves, and they would they would think for themselves. They would replicate themselves into swarms as a weapon, and then go out and attack things. So they're spending money on many 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 of these kind of technologies as we go along. What do I mean by that? I mean by, uh, first of all, their understanding. I went twice, I toured the country speaking in Korea. And every city I went to, I would meet, I'd say anywhere between half a dozen to a dozen people that had been in jail for 20, 25 years under the, uh, under the uh, former dictator who the United States propped up, whose daughter is now the new recently elected president of South Korea. So first of all, there's a whole different kind of consciousness about what, what uh, power does than we've really experienced. And when I'm, when I'm saying they've been in jail, these people were tortured, okay? And so first of all, that, th th so it's a whole different level of thinking and understanding what they're up against, what they're dealing with here. Whereas we have our illusions, you know, we debate, you know, are the Democrats going to bail us out? Is Obama going to have a secret plan in his second term? You know what I mean? We're still Neanderthals in our analysis of this corporate capitalist system that's got its boot on our neck. 
And we're still debating whether or not Obama has really got a secret plan. So that, they're so far advanced on that, on that level. Secondly, they know how to confront authority in a nonviolent way, but they're not at all as passive as we are, even within our nonviolence. Okay? And so it's just, it's just amazing. And then in addition to all that, there's a spirit there that I've never seen amongst anybody. Just to give one illustration, very minor, but Sung Hee Choi, our board member, said to me, you know why we like our food so spicy in Korea? I said, no. She goes, the Japanese hated spicy food. <laughs> and we made our food spicier and spicier and spicier. It was the only, it was like she was telling me, this is all we could do. We were down on our knees. We were, you know, half buried in the, you know, under the boot of this fascist dictatorship. But even then, we still had our dignity. And God damn it, we made our food spicier. <laughs> it's that kind of spirit I'm talking about, okay, that I've never seen anywhere else. That's why anybody that goes to Jeju Island comes away change person. One of our, uh, one of my goals has been to get a lot of Mainers. We've now have six Mainers that have been to uh, Jeju in the last year and a half. Dud Hendrick, one of our leaders in Veterans for Peace, just came back a week ago. This guy was, he's a Vietnam veteran. His heart is with Vietnam. That's all he thinks and talks about because he was just destroyed being in Vietnam. He came back, we had a VFP meeting Thursday night. He said, I didn't want to leave Jeju. I want to go back. He was so, so moved by it all, by these people. And, you know, I'm sure there's many, many stories. I know Kathy, Kathy when Kathy speaks, you, you feel the same, the same spiritual connection with everywhere you go with the people. I'm not saying these people are better than any other people. But I'm saying there's something there that I've never experienced anywhere else. Thank you all very much for your time. <laughs>